In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Through the, the Gospel of last Sunday's Mass, the Church started to prepare us for our Lord's Ascension. You will recall, recall those words of Christ, a little while and you won't see me, and again a little while and you will see me. Today, taking up the subject again, she goes a step further. She mentions the coming of the Holy Ghost, and in so doing, makes use of a passage taken from the Last Supper, in which our Lord speaks to the apostles, preparing them for his departure. We can imagine them listening to him, thoughtful and sad, without the courage to question him. But he breaks the painful silence, saying, Now I go to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, Wherever goest thou? Where are you going? And then, in words of consolation, he tells them, It's expedient that I go, for if I go not, the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So, while the apostles were about to lose the bodily presence of their much-loved much master, he was not going to abandon them, but would continue to help them invisibly by his spirit, who would take up his work with them. He did his work directly in their midst, but the Holy Ghost would do so in a secret but no less real way. Indeed, as our Lord himself said, the action of the Holy Ghost would complete his own work. As he told them, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will teach you in all truth. The apostles, whose minds were still dulled by the effects of sin, did not really understand what he meant. It was necessary that the master, by dying on the cross, destroy sin, sin being the great obstacle to the action of the Holy Ghost. And then, when he had ascended into heaven, he would send this divine paraclete to enlighten them. The sending of the Holy Ghost is the primary fruit of Christ's passion. The Feast of Pentecost, now just three Sundays away, in which we celebrate his coming, should therefore be a particularly grace-filled time for us, just as it was for the apostles at the first Pentecost. Like the apostles, our minds are similarly dulled by the effects of our sins. We are told that they prepared themselves for the coming of the Holy Ghost by fervent prayer, and so we should also pre pre prepare carefully for this great feast so that the coming of the Holy Ghost will be renewed in us in its fullness. But how should we prepare? Before we look at the practicalities, there is one important principle that we must recall. We must be convinced that the action of the Holy Ghost is never interrupted in our souls if we are in a state of grace. If we're in a state of grace, then we know that he dwells and works in us even though we don't see or feel his action in our souls or experience feelings of closeness or consolation. The Holy Ghost is also at work in us as or when we suffer a certain dryness in our spiritual lives. We struggle to pray or feel despondent because of our sins and weaknesses. While his action in us is secret and hidden, it is nonetheless real and effective. If we're convinced of this, then even in the midst of trials and temptations, when we might feel far from God, we will remain confident, trusting in the Holy Ghost, who we know has an exact plan for each of us. Once we've reached a stage in our spiritual lives where we are able to habitually remain in a state of grace, then, in a certain respect, the key to advancement is simply about letting go and learning to trust ever more deeply in God, recognizing that he loves us and that our sanctification, our spiritual progress, is his work, not ours, but our own contribution to it is just to, to cooperate with the graces he gives us. Bearing in mind this underlying principle, 
what, on a practical level, can we do to prepare for Pentecost? Well, since sin is the biggest obstacle to such an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, our preparation must consist in promoting a very special purity of conscience. We should therefore be particularly attentive in avoiding sin, focusing on those dark recesses of our souls which particularly need the light of heavenly grace and truth to shine in their shadowy corners. Sin must be destroyed in us, not just in its particular manifestations, but also in its deeper and most hidden roots. There is no special trick as to how this is achieved. Like the apostles, we should remain constant in prayer. And so daily prayer to the Holy Ghost would be a particularly powerful prayer at this time. The more specific we can be in naming the help and graces we're hoping to receive, the better. And if our prayers are combined with some mortification, some penance and self-sacrifice, then they will be all the more pleasing to our Heavenly Father. But let's also make full use of the sacraments by making a good confession and by receiving our Lord frequently in Holy Communion. Our Lord established the sacraments as the ordinary means to receiving grace. He wants us to make use of them and it pleases him when we do. We can therefore be certain that if we approach the sacraments in a reverent manner, then we will receive their graces, even though their effects are hidden. Through a good confession, not only are our sins forgiven, but we are also given the particular graces we need to help avoid sin in the future. And similarly, let's recall that one of the chief effects of a worthy reception of Holy Communion is the forgiveness of venial sin and a lessening of our sinful inclinations. These are, of course, wonderful gifts if we are serious about eradicating all traces of sin from our lives. So to conclude, just as the apostles became great saints through the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, may our souls and bodies likewise be fully filled by the Spirit of God. And therefore we pray, come Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit and they shall be created and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.